So, friends, good morning. Welcome to this lecture series of geomorphology. And today we are going to start a new topic. It is called fluvial geomorphology. So, if you remember our earlier classes, if you summarize our earlier classes, we are talking about these geomorphic processes, and uh, they are the surficial processes. Eolian process is there. Ocean wave processes are there, glacier processes are there, though glacier process we have not covered yet in the future classes we will talk about the glacier processes. But uh, those geomorphic processes they have their characteristic domains, they have their confined in a particular geological environment where they are more active or they let modify the landscape in their within their own domains. But uh, this river processes, fluvial processes means river processes. So, the river processes, they are the most dominant agent of landscape development. Because if you see this Eolian processes, for example, Indian context if we talk about. In Indian context, the Eolian process mostly it is confined in the Rajasthan, third desert. This Eolian processes are along this coastal plain few meters or few kilometers away from this coast. And uh, this glacial process in advance if I take you to this uh, glacial environment, it will mostly confined in the higher altitudes. But uh, if you see this figure of Indian, if you see this rivers, they are well dominated, well developed and well distributed throughout this subcontinent. So, that is why we can say here the in comparison with these other geomorphic agents, the rivers play major roles in reshaping the earth crust. Similarly, winds, glaciers and ocean waves though they work, but their works are confined to certain parts of this continent or certain parts of this globe. For example, glaciers they are at the higher reaches and uh, higher latitudes. Similarly, winds or arid zones they are confined to particular geological environments, particular geographical regions, but river has no boundary. Even if, if you talk, if you remember when we are talking something about the arid zone geomorphology, there was river existing. Similarly, in glaciers rivers existing or rather glaciers, they are the uh, rivers origin from these glaciers. So, that means, river processes, they are well distributed throughout the globe and that is why river plays major role in reshaping the earth crust as compared to other geomorphic agents. Flowing water on the surface of this earth is the most dominant agent in landscape alteration. So, if you uh, talk about this uh, flowing water processes, it depends upon the terrain. For example, if you go to this alluvial terrains, alluvial field terrains like this Ganga plain in Indian context and we compare with these peninsular rivers. The Ganga plain rivers, they are glacier fed, they are very highly dense network and they readily modify the landscape even if within hundreds of years you will find the changes. Similarly, at the coastal plains, even Kaveri, Godavari, Mahanadis, all these rivers, if you compare it the time series data from this deltaic regions, you will find the changes. But if you go to this in internal part or this uh, uh, interior of this Indian subcontinent where the rivers are confined in the hard rock terrains, their changes are there, but the changes mostly they are very few as compared to these alluvial rivers. So, that means, though flowing water plays a major role, but they are mostly they are there that means, frequent change of this river work is confined or that can be noticeable in this alluvial plains as compared to this uh, hard rock terrains. Care for evaluation by this gentleman credited rivers with 85 to 90 percent of this total present sediment transport to the sea. Glaciers with 7 percent, ground water and waves 1 to 2 percent and wind and volcanoes with less than 1 percent. 
So, that means, whatever these ocean sediments are there nowadays we find, 85 to 90 percent they are contributed from the rivers. That means, they are the terrigenous sediments. They are deposited and transported and deposited mostly around the river mouths and they are redistributed and rearranged by some of this littoral current, some of these waves like that, but their origin is from this continental side or terrestrial sites. Surface weathering and groundwater solution provides load for these flowing streams at the foot of the slope, but uh, eventually rivers must carry all but a small quantity of the total waste from mouth to the destinations. So, here if you it is very important to understand. Though this uh, river system or these tributaries, uh, this catchment area, they produce huge amount of sediment, but not the all sediment they reach up to this uh, ocean or to, to the sink or the depositional site. Most of the sediments they are distributed and redistributed, reworked and confined within the flood plains. So, very less amount they reach up to this uh, ocean and finally, till then it is contributing 85 to 90 percent of this total sediment of this ocean system. Some 1977 included the fluvial system as the area and processes extending from the drainage divides into the source area. Now, you see here if you see this is the river basins and this uh, basics of river basin is that this area which is totally influenced by a river, it is called river basin. It is marked as this red boundary and these are the tributaries, they contribute, they collect water, they contribute sediment and water to this trunk river and this is the main stream or the strong trunk stream and here these are the distributaries. So, the tributaries, the distributaries and the trunk system, trunk river system, they collectively call the river basin. And the river basin mostly from this higher reaches or the tributaries, either irrespective of their order, the tributaries they collect water and sediment, they contribute water to the sediment to this trunk river and the trunk system they transport it to this uh, distributor through the distributaries they distribute, but that does not mean during transportation there will be no deposition. There are during floodings there are huge sediments are transported and river is overflowing and the sediments they are distributed within their flood plains. So, once this flood plain is deposited and uh, gradual year by year this is deposition of sediments they promote the soil development and after soil development the system is capped and it is immobilized. So, that is why the sediment which is originated from here it is transported through this trunk river within that time they may there are chances within the flood plains they confine themselves, but very less sediments they are transported to this river mouth and distributed and 85 to 90 percent of this sediment reach here they are contributed to this ocean system. So, a river system can be divided into three subdivisions as we have discussed. One is the collecting system, collecting system means the tributaries, they collect water and the transporting system or the trunk river, they transport and the distributing system or distributaries mostly it is found at this river mouth. So, here consist of a network of distributaries of the mouth of the river the deltas, where sediment and water are dispersed into ocean, a lake or a dry, a dry basins. So, depends upon the basin position, either it will be the sink, the basin position either it will be in a ocean basin or it will be a lake or it will be a dry basin like this playas in this arid zones. So, irrespective of this there are three main systems of the river one is collecting system, the transporting system and it is a depositional system. So, in a lighter moment in this class we can hear uh, when quote a gentleman's word in 1980, Dr. J. F. Kennedy, former director of Iowa Institute of Hydraulic USA, he has compared the river with women with some justification. I am quoting his own words. Rivers like women are sustainer of life, yes that is why if you see our uh, earlier uh, 
this is this figure we can see here these are this rivers these are this civilization sites and the all the civilization site civilization sites if we join them they are here they are running through this paleo channels so the rivers they are sustainer of life second thing that the rivers can change their moods frequently as women they may flow very gently at one moment and may great flurry in the next moment and this third comparison was of course they are not fully understood yet this may be this supported by a quote from this preface of this book by miss muriswa entitled streams men's attempt to control rivers had little or no success in fact many times this effort has been complicated this situation this greatest natural disaster comes as a result of ignorance or even worse half knowledge so that's why these are there's few reasons that can be compared when that's why our ancestors has realized this aspects of rivers carefully and gave feminine names to rivers like kosiki narmada mohanadi godavari kaveri yamuna and ganga it is so that's why we can say the rivers they are the sustainers of life because your ancient our ancient uh, civilizations like mohenjo-daro harappa or kalibanga whatever these situations are there in the in this map we can say that all these situations all these uh, uh, systems that means all these locations of this ancient civilizations they are falling on the river basins similarly nowadays also this uh, river basins or this uh, river near to this river the population is more as similarly near to the coast the population is more as compared to the other part so that's why rivers are very important in human life so beauty of a river depends upon its cleanness of water and utility to mankind to development a river which is flowing through a barren land without use of its water is of less importance as compared to other parts rivers are rich in wealth irrigation water coal petroleum mineral drinking water and finally the peace so many of these river basins like uh, um, this swarnarekha this uh, markanda the river through rivers we are getting placer golds similarly placer minerals are deposited coal most, most of the bajaria coal field whatever this coal field earlier was there most of that are fluvial and lacustrine environments similarly petroleum river basins or river sediments and uh, river sediments are source for and uh, reservoir for petroleum hydrocarbon in many cases so um, the river string that is called so string sands they are very good producer of uh, petroleum hydrocarbon similarly irrigation water the river basins in indian context if you see this north indian system that is this ganga plain this plenty of water is available though it is depleting nowadays due to overuse of this water but uh, river basins they are the source for ground water and finally peace if you compare our if you analyze our ancient vedas uh, you will find the most of this uh, river basins or the along this river at the bank of the river these people who are getting meditated they are doing meditation and this great buddha they also got this nirvan along this ganga river also so that means rivers in every stage of our human life river is important starting from its water its wealth its peace and uh, the economic minerals so we are getting from this rivers that's why river is important it is therefore necessary to understand the role of river in changing this landscape on this earth surface and the effect of landscape change on the river processes how the landscape change also the affect the river process and how the river change the landscape both are important to understand one is influencing other and other is influencing one so now here if you see here rivers are formed by this association of streams and they provide water to the streams size of a river depends upon this number of streams involved the ground condition through which the river flow and the climate of this catchment and this whole river basin so here three points to be understood to, to be understood here one is 
size of a river depends upon the number of streams involved. For example, if you see this river basin here, number of streams, more number of streams involved, larger the river basin. Similarly, the ground condition through which the river flow, ground conditions, ground condition either it is flowing through hard rock terrain, it is flowing through soft rock terrain or even if in hard rock terrain if it is passing through sandstone, it is passing through granite, passing through limestone like this. For example, suppose a river is flowing through sandstone which is porous and permeable. So, that means here much of this river water will percolate down from ground water. So, that is why there will be less water in the surface that will transport further downstream. Similarly, rivers passing through limestone, there are many chances that uh, some of this limestone or karst topography will form and the river will grow underground. But rivers, it is which is rivers which is flowing along this granitic terrain, there are granite which is hard and compact, no porosity and permeability. So, entire surface runoff will be there. So, here river size will be larger. So, that depends upon the substrate ground condition through which the river is flowing through, okay. then climatic conditions. Climatic condition that means suppose for example, we take this case of Markanda. Markanda which is originating from the Siwalik and through Rajasthan, through Haryana it is passing through and in Rajasthan it is vanishing somewhere. So, it is terminating there, but had it been in the other part like this UP and near to this Ganges, Ganges part. So, it might have flowed somewhat more distance and reached to certain extent or to, to further downstream. So, that means depends upon the climate. So, if it is arid climate, there will be more chance that there will be evapotranspirations, evaporation will be there. So, less water will flow along this uh, surface of this river bed. So, that is why depends upon this climatic condition, if it is moving through a uh, humid climate, so the river water, the amount of water increases further downstream, but if it is moving uh, uh, the through arid climate, so the water is decreasing in downstream. So, that is why it is this number of streams involved that uh, substrate or this subsurface topography, subsurface lithology and uh, this uh, climatic condition through which the river can pass through that uh, says about that uh, what should be the size of a river. Fluvial processes vary in intensity among climatic region and along gradients of temperature, precipitation, altitude and seasonality. It is important here. Temperature we have discussed, precipitation, more precipitation, more water will be added to the system. Altitude, if it is from the higher altitude, that means glacier, it is there glacier fed or it is from, it is from plain fed or it is mountain fed. So, depending upon the which part of the which reaches this uh, and what should be the, what is the source of the water for the river and seasonality, it is a seasonal, a seasonal, either there will be seasonal river, that means ephemeral streams, they are seasonal, during rainy, rainy seasons they are getting water to the streams. Perhaps one third of this land surface has no runoff to the ocean. However, even arid regions with drainage into closed intermountain basins have landscapes of branches of streams and valleys. Infrequent or brief seasonal streams flow can shape otherwise dry landscapes. So, if you see, we have already discussed about this arid zone geomorphology, we have already uh, talking about this uh, pediments, pediment evolution, the playas and how this pediment is developed and how this uh, surface, it is uh, pediment surface is curved or uh, convex upward towards the mountain. So, all these regions, if we analyze in the geological past or the present also, we will find the rivers, the presence of rivers, but uh, some of these rivers they are permanent, some of the rivers they are ephemeral or seasonal, but rivers presence will be there, channel presence will be there. Furthermore, on the time scale with which the landscape evolved, climatic regions have shifted and changed in intensity, so that many regions now intensely arid show evidence of a previous fluvial erosion and deposition. So, that means the paleo drainage system the paleo climate, the paleo uh, latitude, longitude, geographic locations, 
that also depends upon how a river system will be there. For example, if you take here this uh, system, uh, example, it, it is a part of, it is a drainage map part of this Pranita Godavari Valley in Maharashtra. You see this nowadays the river, the main river it is flowing here in westward and finally moving south. And uh, now if you analyze it in the geological past, some of this evidence are there within that river basin that these are the cross beddings with the river was migrated, it was flowing to this west. And now this the river is flowing to south. So, that does not mean the same river is continuing, but that means I want to say it is the topography, it is topographic inversion. Now, see in this earlier times when this uh, Indian uh, subcontinent was in uh, northern latitude about 45 degree or so. So, during protozoic time this this particular area has a topography which is sloping towards west. So, nowadays this particular area is sloping as a slope towards the south which is following these major reports. That means, I want to say with time with change in topography with change in geological time scale the rivers also change their properties, rivers also change their um, sediment production, their change in their characteristics. So, that means, in a particular time scale also with due to land, landscape evolve, similarly the fluvial system evolves. So, this fluvial system evolve, it is totally sometimes it is climatic control, sometimes it is tectonically control, sometimes it is tectonic climate both control. So, that means, depending upon this changing scenario of tectonics and climate, depend uh, the rivers basins they also change accordingly. Similarly, in this coastal plain rivers if you see here that depends upon this uh, um, this change of sea level. Here if you see these are these changes of sea level marked in earlier times when these solid lines are there uh, this here earlier all the rivers were debouching this line and later they debauched it here, now they are debauching here. So, once the rivers are debauching here, that means sediments were distributed somewhere here, now sediment deposited here and now it is depositing here. So, that means with changing scenario, with changing sea level, rivers their shift, rivers shift their positions and this shifting, this also affect this uh, sediment um, transportation, sediment deposition, sediment redistribution like that. So, that means, geology of a river basin, geomorphology and geology of a river basin, that depends upon many factors that is sink position and climatic conditions, substrate, number of streams, sea level fluctuation or this base level fluctuation or local base level fluctuation depending upon this uh, either there is a lake uh, or the river is debouching, it is not related to the sea. So, that means, I want to say the local base level fluctuation the number of streams involved, the substrates, the climate, the, all that uh, uh, tectonics, all those factors they work independently or together to define the characteristics of the river basin, to define the sediment production of the river basin, uh, the flood plains like that. How a fluvial system develop? That all we have discussed about this fluvial system this characteristics. Now, the question arises how a fluvial system develop here. The proportion of surface and subsurface water that feeds a stream varies greatly with climate, soil type, bedrock, slope, vegetation and many other factors. These are the prominent factors and some other factors are also there. Here once we say a river, a flowing stream not only the surface water is contributing, it is the subsurface water also which is contributing to the system. So, this subsurface and surface water both they contribute to the stream, I so that is why the river or the stream can be said it is influent or effluent rivers. So, I will talk about later what is called influent or effluent rivers. So, one estimate is that one eighth of this annual runoff of this hydraulic cycle, hydrological cycle goes directly overland to the sea and seven eighth of this water goes underground and leached briefly. So, that means one eighth of the system or the one river 
which is flowing its water, one eighth of the return is river water is going to the sea directly, it is overland flow and seven eighth is going underground, goes underground at least briefly. So, this underground this that depends upon the substrate condition, it depends upon the climatic conditions. In a humid climate, during a light steady rain or a land on a landscape with a continuous vegetation cover, infiltration may continue for a long time. The water moving downward through this zone of variation towards the water table. So, that means it is contributing the subsurface. Steady rain, it is continuous rain, but it is slow rain. But if it is heavy rain, it is sudden, sudden or is heavy rain with a uh, few minutes or few hours. So, this water will not saturate, that much water will not able to percolate down. So, much water will be overland flow, that will call, called overland flow. So, that means infiltration may continue for a long time if there is a steady and continuous rain with a humid climate with vegetation. So, that means it is contributing subsurface flow or groundwater situation. With infiltration capacity of soil is controlled by duration and intensity of precipitation, prior weighted condition of the soil, vegetation, soil mineralogy and texture, slope and other factors. So, infiltration capacity of a soil, how much water will be infiltrate, how this soil or this substrate is capable to infiltrate downward. So, that depends upon the duration intensity of precipitation, duration intensity that means more time it will precipitate, more it will go down. So, prior wetted condition of the soil, prior wetted conditions means whether this is a dry soil or it is a wet soil. Then vegetation, it is barren or it is a vegetated land. Soil mineralogy, what is this substrate mineralogy is there, if it is clay minerals are there or it is quartz feldspathic minerals are there or that means those minerals which are capable to absorb water, those type of minerals are there or this minerals which are not able to absorb water only these pore spaces will contain water that minerals are there. Then slope, if it is higher slope that means sudden water will flow down, if it is lower slope water will interact more time with the surface and will percolate downward and some other factors are there. So, these are these uh, conditions, these are the factors that depends upon how much water will infiltrate downward and how much it will contribute from the subsurface and how much it will contribute from the surface. However, eventually the soil voids with fill in water and saturation overland flow will begin. So, if the rainfall is so intense that infiltration cannot keep pace Hottonian overland flow may begin sooner. This is soil is saturated with depth, soil is not saturated with depth. So, if you see there are two types of overland flow, one is called saturation overland flow, another is called Hottonian overland flow. What, what is the difference between the two? If you see here, these are the two, this is called saturation overland flow and this is Hottonian overland flow. Here in Hottonian overland flow, there will be heavy rain and water will flow on the surface without saturating the internal pore spaces of the soil. Now, you see here these are these boulders and here only these few meters or few depth, few centimeter or few meters of this part of the soil is saturated and much of this water is going down this is overland flow. But here this overland flow is not due to this it is due to the oversaturation. That means, here you see the whole space, whole pore space of this system is saturated and that is why the water, can, the soil cannot absorb more water that is why overland flow is occurring. This is called saturation overland flow or saturation excess overland flow, but here it is called infiltration excess overland flow. That means, not much infiltration is able to uh, go down through this uh, soil and this is called also Hottonian overland flow. So, this Hottonian overland flow and uh, this uh, saturation overland flow irrespective of their region. So, they are contributing the surface flow of this water. When surface layer becomes saturated, overland flow begins and soil particles loosen by raindrop impact 
of turbulence are entrained by this flow. So, now we have water which is flowing and sediments is entrained or soil particles, sand particles is entrained through the drop. So, that means now we have water as well as sediment together, so where they are flowing. So, that means water sediment together that means erosional capacity is increasing because if you remember our earlier classes when we were talking something about this uh, development of nodes in the wave action. So, initial time there will be less rate of weathering because water was only agent, but later on when much more and more sediment is added together. So, this original capacity of this wave increases and finally, the rate of weathering increases and finally, rather uh, in the later time it is also decreases due to absorbance of energy. But here also same similar thing happens when water was flowing alone and water is flowing with sediments. So, that means we are increasing the original capacity of the water. So, I think we should stop here and in the next class we will discuss about what are the different type of flows and how they contribute for the generation stream and what is their role in a sediment transport and furthermore. So, I think we should stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.